two verses from Exodus chapter 3, just to uh, give you an idea of what, what I'm going to you know, bring to you today. This is Israel in uh, Egypt. And it says, verse 23, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groan, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged. He goes on to say in verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Of course, that was Moses, wasn't it? He was sent to do the job of going to Pharaoh to bring them out. A few weeks ago, I was sort of waiting on the Lord to know what to bring for the new year. Um, sometimes I get something fresh for the new year, and sometimes I don't. <laughs> um, I suppose we make a lot of the new year, don't we? But really, it's just a continuation of the calendar, isn't it? You come to uh, month 12, and it rolls on again to month 1. It's our calendar, isn't it? It's like sometimes the chapters in the Bible, um, if you start reading, you'll find that it is a continuation of the last verse in the previous chapter. And so sometimes the chapters are a bit of a nuisance because they break up the flow of the message what God wants us to hear. And so, yeah, 2022. There's a lot of things happened, isn't there, over the last two years. We're still suffering now, aren't we? Still trying to come to grips with what is taking place in the world. God has a plan. And thank God for that, that he has a plan. Even though we can't, can't quite see it, he has a plan. And we have to trust him with all of our hearts. Yeah, a lot of things have changed during the COVID years. I think we might have changed a bit. Perhaps the worst, but then I believe also for the better. Because it's caused us to pray on and to believe God and to see changes take place. And so we, we, we've seen a lot of negatives. We've seen some churches closed. We've seen some churches that have really changed the whole face of their service. Um, one fairly near to us here. I don't believe me anymore at the moment on a Sunday morning. But they have an afternoon meeting, um, <clears throat> perhaps once or twice a month. There's a, a group of churches I go to to preach. And uh, I go to one quite early in the morning. And then I have to get me, uh, pull my socks up and get the car wrecked and go down to the next one. And I've only got about 20 minutes to get there before I start another service at 11.30. But they haven't got the two anymore. They've decided to come down to one. Well, it makes my life a little bit easier than the other 
creature that goes there. But you see, shrinkage. We don't want shrinkage, do we? We want expansion. We want to see God's kingdom come in power. And we want to see souls saved and won. And so we've got to try and overcome what the enemies put upon us, this uh, bondage. And you can understand how the children of Israel felt. You know? Um, they had been in the land for something like 400 years. And they started to come when Jacob came with his uh, sons. And then they eventually met up with Joseph. And so some of them settled there because there was famine in the land. And so Joseph was able to feed them. And so, really, we've got to trust God to be positive, for us to be positive, to know that we are in the kingdom of God, which is something really powerful. It's powerful, more powerful than Satan's bondage. And you see, they, they were under oppression, they were under slavery. At one point, Pharaoh decided, you can find your own straw to make the bricks to do the building work. Wow, that is really, really rigorous, isn't it? That's hard, isn't it, to go around scraping the ground for straw so you can build bricks. So they were under terrible bondage. But you see, God saw that, just as he sees us. He heard their cry, their groans, their oppression. And it says that God came down and he delivered them. A mighty miracle. It wasn't just a small group of people that he delivered. It was a nation of over two million people that came out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea and went into the wilderness. And we know the story there. Eventually they got into the land of Canaan, which was flowing with milk and honey. The thing is, make sure you get there in the end. <laughs> you might have a few detours in life, but keep pressing on. You'll get there to your destination in the end. I was reading the other day when I was trying to prepare this about something that George the Sixth said when he was preparing a message to give over the radio to encourage people in the British Isles to trust God during those war years. Now I was born at the end of the war, 1945, so I don't know what the war was like. I, I, can't, I can't really comment on what people went through. I can only listen to me. Mum and Dad when they were alive, telling me some of the traumas that they went through. But this is what um, he said. He was about to bring the Christmas message spoken by King George VI to the nation at the beginning of the last war. At the suggestion of the then Princess Elizabeth, our Queen of course, he quoted Minnie Louise Haskins. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God. That shall be to you better than a light and a safer way, which is a known way. If the king could say that, facing the darkest days of the war, I want to say to you, if we want a light to walk safely into this new year, put your hand into the hand of God, because that will be better than any light and safer than any known man. And so it's about faith, isn't it? Putting our hand into this new year, that God will grab hold of it and guide us and propel us through the year, not knowing what we're going to discover, not knowing what's going to happen. God is in control. God sees. God remembers. God knows. Yeah. I'm 
glad that we serve a God like that. That he looks upon us. And really, he's got the best for us. If we could only believe it and see it. Really, what I want to sort of say this morning, I want to turn you to Romans 15. It's only one verse of scripture. As we face the unknown, God is with us. We have to trust Him. We have to be prepared to do things His way. And this is a verse, verse 13. It says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you say, oh, that would make a lovely benediction at the end of the service. And sometimes we quote that verse. I quote it sometimes to close a meeting. You look at that text, you think, what? Oh, it's an interesting text. Preachers grab hold of it and think, Oh yeah, there's a good bit of textual preaching here. It all, all splits up into nice little segments. Notice what Paul was trying to say. He says, now may the God. And if you look at verse 5, it says a similar word. Now may the God of patience and comfort. You see, what he's trying to do, he's trying to point us to God and say, now, God has got something for you. This is a key. And if you read the scriptures, you find certain keys. And, and here is a key. And it says there, May the God of hope, oh, I'm glad that our God is a God of hope. If you've got no hope, then come to God. Trust in Him, and you'll receive hope. The God of hope is with us, dear friends. He won't let us down. He won't let us defend for ourselves because he's a God that loves us and he has a plan for each one of our lives. He's the God of hope. And you know something? He will put hope within our hearts. If we haven't got hope, you know, if we face traumatic crisis or circumstances, perhaps what we don't know what we're going to face during this year, if we feel empty, if we feel worried, he can come and replace it with his hope. And there's nothing like knowing the hope of God. You know, the scriptures reveal who God is. He's our living hope. And if we put our trust in him, he's going to get us through this coming year. And it says here, May the God of hope fill you. Oh, I'm so glad that God is a divine filler. You know, you go to the dentist if you've got a toothache, and sometimes it says you need a new filling. I'll fill it up. But first of all, I've got to drill the old one out. Do you remember the old days? A grinding, slow drill. And you could feel pain and vibration going right throughout your jaw. <laughs> Horrible. Now they've got modern techniques. You don't even feel it now. You know, and shh, like that, and it's out. Well, God wants to fill each one of us so we can face this new year. Mm, good, isn't it? You see, God is somebody outside of ourselves. You see, we're good, good at times at fixing things. I, I am. I, I, I like to fix things. I like to solve things. If there's a problem, I'll sort it. <laughs> Half the time, I can't. <laughs> and in the end, I call for help. <laughs> we're all like that, aren't we? Sometimes we've got a sense of pride. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I can remember the days when I used to change my own oil, used to lay flat on my back, undoing the uh, bolts and the nuts, 
and take the oil filter out. I tried that a few years ago, and when I got up, I fell over again because I just felt giddy. <laughs> She's okay, is it? I, I think you'd better take it next time to a mechanic, you know? Don't try and solve it. They're the experts. I know you pay a bit extra, but let them have the responsibility. Yeah, I said, yeah. I think the days of uh, doing mechanics is over. <laughs> you have to give up in the end, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, the God of hope fill you. And he wants to fill our lives. He wants to fill our lives with good things. Because he's a good God. Hallelujah. Yeah. He's got a lot of good things in his treasury in heaven. And he wants to fill us. But he says there, fill you with all. He's got everything, isn't he, our God? He's got a whole vast treasury of good things, of goodies up in heaven. And he wants us to have it all. Yeah? Are you greedy? Are you hungry for God? Are you desperate for God? Are you desiring for God to do more in your life? To give you more? To equip you more? To make you stronger? Well, if you've got that desire, God will always give us the desires of our heart. That's Psalm, Psalm 37, is it? Delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Well, what's he want to fill us with? Well, there are two important things here. It says, to fill you all with joy and peace in believing. Joy. You know, that's an important, we could call it a grace, we could call it a, a gift, we could call it a fruit. And it's the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? But joy is something important in all of our lives. And if we haven't got joy, we become religiously boring people. Do you know that? <laughs> we moan at everything. We criticise everything. Because we lack joy. But when we're filled with the joy of the Lord, it changes your whole personality. You become a positive person. A stable person, a settled person. Now a few years ago, when Philip and Jonathan were little toddlers, growing up we went to Beauty Baptist Church. And it was the start of some of these lovely choruses. You know what's coming. I do. And so, <laughs> we learned the chorus that said, Joy, 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 in my heart is ringing. Joy, 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 Jesus keeps me singing. And Philip there, he learned that one. And I can remember him now. He tried to have a clap and going, Doy, 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 <laughs> my heart is singing. <laughs> he wanted the joy. The congregation wanted the joy. And we got the joy. <laughs> and guess what? I married Glenis Joy. Ah, I've got joy in my, my life. <laughs> yeah, joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's what Nehemiah discovered. And David one day in Psalm 16, verse 11, I think it is, he says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. Oh, I like that. Oh Lord, give us fullness of joy. And Jesus said, in me, you shall have joy. So we want Jesus' in joy. And in the Acts of the Apostles, I think it's chapter 13 somewhere or other, it says that the early disciples were filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that's good, isn't it? Joy of God, joy of Jesus, joy of the Holy Spirit. And so it's an important fruit that we need in our lives. Yeah? We are different people if we are filled with the joy of the Lord. 
because we then start to give something away to people. You know, if we're cold and critical and miserable, people look at us and think, well, they haven't got much of a Christian. <clears throat> Keep away from church. They've got nothing to offer. But when we're full of joy, and it becomes a smile on our face, and a smile in our heart, then we become different people. We become positive. And then it goes on to say, joy and peace in believing. Peace, an important quality, <coughs> is peace. I believe that the opposite to peace is fear. And we can easily sometimes get frightened. The enemy loves to say things to us, to whisper in our ear lies and doubts. So we become fearful. But Jesus does the opposite. He brings peace. The Word of God, when we read it, brings us peace. The promises of God brings us peace. When we go through a calamity, when we go through an experience that's not very nice, we can fall apart. <clears throat> Sometimes <clears throat> people need ministry because they've been dramatically influenced by the experience they've gone through. And one of the things that they need to rediscover is the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all our understanding. And we need His peace. Do you know something? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Amen? And as we come to Him, our Prince, our Lord, our Saviour, He gives us His peace. And it quickens us, it stabilises us, it settles us in the Christian life. It gives us confidence because we can step forward knowing that we have God with us. And Jesus has made that promise, hasn't he? He said, I'll be, I will be with you even to the ends of the age. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's with us and he grants us his peace. Now what's the point of having all these things? Well, the text says that you might abound in hope. Abound. What does that mean? It means overflowing. It means that you can't get anything more in you. It just overflows. <laughs> I remember a situation only last, yeah, no, it was this month, no, December. I was preaching at Sailing um, Church and I, I, I forgot to fill up and so as I went over there, there's a te Texaco garage. I thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm quite early because I always like to go into places nice and early um, so I can, you know, pray and not be under pressure. And so I, I called into the garage, did the usual, put the nozzle in. And I suppose I, I, I lost my concentration as I was thinking of the message I was going to preach. And then uh, all of a sudden, I thought to myself, goodness, the needle was going round. I've got, I've got a lot in this tank. Then I looked down and it was overflowing all over the ground. It didn't cut out. It's probably my fault. I probably either stuck it in too far or didn't stick it in enough. But anyway, I was saturated with petrol. Ugh. So I, I paid a bit extra. <laughs> Went in, paid the uh, petrol bill, and I said, I'm awfully sorry. I've made a mess out there. I don't know what happened, I said, but there's petrol on your forecourt. Oh, don't worry, sir. It, it always happens. So I've got my phone and went off. You see, overflowing. We don't want to overflow with fuel, with petrol. But we want to overflow with the goodness of God, don't we? Yeah? We, we want to abound. We want to be sort of pressed down and running over, yeah? In our Christian lives. Because people are going to take more note of us if we've got some extra to give them than it was that 
than it is if you've got nothing to give people. Sometimes we have a job to give a smile to people. Because what's going on in our lives, we can't muster a smile or a kind word. But it's important that we do, isn't it? Is to stay riveted and fixed upon Jesus. And so it says there, that you might abound in hope. And the key, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You see, let's just stop and think for a minute. Where's Jesus now? He's in heaven, isn't he? The Bible says quite clearly in Acts 1 that he left this world, he ascended up into the heavens and gone back to his Father. That's his position now. He's up there, sitting on the throne at the right hand of God. I think he's been busy over the last 2,000 years with the angels getting ready our eternal home. Yeah, you've got a mansion up there. Well, some of you have. <laughs> some of you might just have a little uh, corrugated heart. No, no, I'm only joking. Yeah. And so he's been sitting up there, just waiting for the Father to say to him, go on, go and get them, bring them home. Yeah. And so, when Jesus went back, he gave the disciples a promise. He says, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you another comforter. Ooh. And in the Greek, it means another, it means the same of the same kind. Another of the same kind. So what they were going to receive would be the same as Jesus, but it wouldn't be a figure, it wouldn't be a person that they could touch or speak to. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Fire rested on their heads, and they spake in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so they had fire. Peter was a transformed man. He preached his first message and he made an appeal and 3,000 people got saved that day. That's a miracle, isn't it? That's revival for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, God knew that the, uh, the, the church needed some divine energy. But it was going to be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Where's the Holy Spirit now? He's in us. Yeah? The Bible says He's with you and He's in you. That's good news, isn't it? So we need to overflow in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in Ephesians that the Holy Spirit was given as a down payment, absolutely guaranteed that one day we will see Jesus again. And Jesus will come. And we will be called up into his presence. Yes. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I just sort of feel that this might be a word of encouragement to you this morning. That you can take it with you throughout this new year. That may the God of hope fill you with all joy in believing that you might abound in hope by the power 